Hey, it's time to start making plans to attend the premier true crime event of the year, CrimeCon UK. CrimeCon is the world's number one true crime event, and if you're fascinated by all things true crime, you won't want to miss it. CrimeCon UK will be held on June 10th and 11th at the Leonardo Royal Hotel Tower Bridge in London. What is CrimeCon? CrimeCon is part education, part advocacy, part discovery, and 100% fun when you attend with your true crime obsessed friends. Don't have true crime obsessed friends or family? No problem. You'll find your tribe at CrimeCon UK. Attendees say that CrimeCon was not only the best weekend of their entire year, but they left with a great experience and new friends. Over CrimeCon weekend, you'll get up close and personal with true crime experts, learn from advocates for justice, and rub elbows with true crime stars and celebs, like documentary filmmakers, investigators, and podcasters involved with some of the most talked about true crime cases today. In the breakout sessions, you will delve deeper into cases and hear real life stories directly from survivors and victims' families. And you won't want to miss one of the most popular features of CrimeCon, Podcast Row, where you'll meet all your favorite true crime podcasters and YouTubers from around the world. I'll be there again to meet you all, and I can't wait. So get your tickets today and mark your calendars for June 10th and 11th in London. Go to crimecon.co.uk to get more information and register. Use my offer code once upon for discounted tickets. CrimeCon UK, the ultimate true crime event. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Today, I have a special treat for my listeners. Once in a while, I like to share with you all something I've listened to or I've read or I've watched that I think you'll love. And this time I've discovered a, a true crime miniseries that's one of the most intriguing whodunits I've heard about in a while. And I'm sure once you dive into the story, you'll be as riveted as I was as you ask yourself, Who Killed Robert Wan? Which is the title of this captivating series now streaming on Peacock. I'm pleased to speak today with the producer of Who Killed Robert Wan, Paul Epstein. He's an Emmy-nominated producer, writer, and director of several films, television series, historical documentaries, and true crime series for networks like MSNBC, Discovery ID, Nat Geo, and the History Channel. So I'm really, really excited to talk to him today. Thank you, Paul, for speaking with me today, and I welcome you to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So I heard about this case briefly, like a while back. Uh, gosh, I think it's been several years on another podcast, but it was the only time I ever heard about it. And I'm sure maybe because I'm on the other side of the country, um, I'm in California. So maybe this wasn't something that uh, maybe was on my radar. But before we get into this fascinating crime story, I wanted to learn a little bit about what drew you to this case, because I don't think it was so you know widely known, or maybe I'm wrong. But I guess what I'm asking besides that is if you've always been interested in true crime, stories like this, or was it this case in particular that caught your attention? Well, this case in particular caught my attention. Um, I'm not uh, so much a true crime uh, director and producer, although I've done several projects. But I was working with the uh, federal prosecutor who was trying to prosecute this, uh, this case, this trial, uh, named Glenn Kirshner on a different project for MSNBC. It was a true crime series called Capital Crimes because Glenn was the uh, chief of the Homicide Prosecuting Department in Washington, D.C. for a long time. And when I was working with Glenn on this other show, he mentioned a couple of times that he had this really fascinating case that um, he thought I might be interested in hearing about. Not necessarily to promote himself into being in a show about it or anything, but he knew this is something that I would find interesting or that possibly MSNBC or some other, some other network would find interesting. And Glenn Kirshner is a, is a great guy. He's very friendly. He's very affable. And as a you know federal prosecutor, of course, he's a great talker. And he just started talking to me about this case and how he got involved 
and the extraordinary twists and turns of the whole thing, I was immediately hooked. So I, it took very little time for me to realize that Glenn was right, that this was a fascinating story, uh, one that deserved much bigger attention and recognition than maybe had gotten um, over the past several years and one that would really make a great true crime show. So that's the thing I would, I just, just came to my mind, you know, you've produced so many different kinds of projects. I imagine you kind of look at these because they're all basically nonfiction. I I assume um, that you kind of look at it though, as how to tell a story. So it's kind of a storytelling thing. And, and it seems to me because, I mean, this is kind of how we pay attention to things, right? Is like, We can have, you know, facts about things or we could read a news article, maybe, you know, a paragraph or two in the newspaper. But until somebody really lays it out like this story, the beginning, the middle and the end, what happened and maybe, like you said, twists and turns, does it really kind of leap to the attention of the general public, I think? Do you know what I mean? Was that part of it was the story element of this? As I started watching this, I realized it's like if you're reading a book, you want to keep turning the page. Like, what? Like, what happened next? What does this mean? You know, that kind of a story. So is that kind of the sensibility that you have when you pick a project to work on? When I pick a project to work on, it's usually because I feel like there's going to be a really great, compelling story to be told. Um, You know, certainly almost all true crime stories, wherever they are on podcasts or TV or in books or what have you, um, they really create great stories. And I think that's what audiences really respond to. They really want to know what happened and then what happened next, what happened next. And they follow the case and they the really great stories have, again, lots and lots of twists and turns. They have surprising events. Um, They have characters that turn out to be not what they seemed from the beginning. Um, They have new revelations. And so for a a viewer or a consumer of these stories, it's just incredibly satisfying. They really are page turners or, you know, binge watch type stories. So this one, uh, Who Killed Robert Wong, the story of Robert Wong's death, um, had all of that in in spades. Um, Again, when I started working with Glenn on on developing this into a, into a project, the more he revealed about it, the more I realized it was going to be a deeper and deeper rabbit hole every time he told me some new revelation. Um, and each piece of the puzzle that he explained and each piece of the puzzle that we worked out together, I was working on the show kind of led to another piece, but when you put them all together, the pieces still would never really add it up to a complete picture. And that was really compelling. It was really interesting. And so without getting into um, spoiling the shows, in the murder of Robert Wan, um, there are so many different forces at play in the actual case and in the story of the case. There is the victim. Um, there are the three men who become the primary suspects of killing Robert Wan. Um, when you start to unravel the stories of these three men who lived together in a polyamorous relationship. There were three gay men living together in a house um, in Washington, D.C. When you start to unravel the sort of the secrets and the revelations of their relationship, and then you get into the ins and outs of the investigation itself, it's like pulling apart uh, the threads of a sweater. Like you just keep pulling on threads and they take you in different places. And when you reach the outcome of the story, which of course I won't try to try not to give away, um, the outcome is not what anybody would ever expect, and in some ways, it is a challenging outcome. It's an outcome that makes you really wonder about how our system of justice uh, either works or doesn't work, and it really makes us wonder about how we perceive people that have been either accused of a crime or convicted of a crime, and how we kind of reconcile with you know, being in the world of people that go through these ordeals. Um, so... The case had um, had dozens and dozens of things I thought could be a great main story and then dozens more that could be great sort of subplots. And then, you know, uh, just a myriad ways of getting into the story and unpacking the story and discovering all these fascinating secrets that add up to uh, this core mystery of who killed Robert Wan. I guess I want to start at the beginning here is just if you could tell us who Robert Wan was and how did the events unfold? This is August 2nd, 2006. How did he come to be at the place where he was, where, you know, later we're going to f- discover that he becomes a murder victim? So uh, Robert Wan was, uh, in 2006, he was a uh, youngish lawyer, I think was in his 30s or so. He was um, happily married. 
And uh, he was working for a government agency called Radio Free Asia as a senior counsel. And he had just gotten this job recently. And so he was in touch with two college friends, uh, Joe Price and Victor Zaborski. They had all gone to college together and become pretty close friends. And in fact, uh, Joe Price and Victor Zaborski had attended Robert's wedding and they had done social events and Robert's wife had met them and they all considered themselves friends. So uh, the night that Robert died, uh, they had prearranged for Robert to spend the night at the home of Joe Price and Victor Zaborski and the third person in that relationship, Dylan Ward, really just as a convenience for Robert to be able to get to an early meeting the next day at the office, uh, which was not far from their home. And it was sort of a casually planned event. I'll just drop by, I'll sleep in the guest bedroom, catch up briefly, and, and really really not an event, so to speak, that in and of itself would have been noteworthy. And what is worth Noting is, again, they were all quite good friends. Joe and uh, Robert, in particular, were very close friends in college. Joe Price has was a, a senior, I believe, when uh, Robert was a freshman, and Joe was his college advisor and a mentor, and he had helped guide him through college and uh, met a mentor of sorts through law school and so forth. And Robert wanted to become quite close to uh, Victor Zaborski, too. So Joe Price... And Victor Zaborski were in a civil relationship and a, a, a marriage together in D.C. So it gets a little confusing once you get the names straight because there are four names that interplay with each other all the time. And as a storyteller, as the executive producer of a show like this, getting the stories, getting the names presented well and getting the characters oriented well is a challenge because there's a lot of people that all kind of carry equal weight. But to answer your question, uh, Robert was just spending the night at the house, um, which is in a very tony part of Washington, D.C., uh, with his college friends, Joe Price and uh, Victor Zaborski. And it was only because he was attending a meeting at work the next morning and their home was close by and it was just a casual, I'll just crash here and go to the meeting in the morning. So it starts off with, it's something, it seems just very you know innocuous. You're going to spend a night with a friend at a friend's house. And within not too much time later, after he arrives, there's a 911 call. So we see that in the show. It's very dramatic. But then I think there's one baffling aspect in a series of baffling aspects to this this story. And the first one is if you could describe a little bit what the crime scene looked like. Because I don't think it's what anybody would expect to see when police arrive at a scene where you know that a violent crime has occurred. If you could explain that a little bit, just so people can get a sense of how this starts out and how it even gets more strange, you know, they can find that out and when they watch, but just to kind of set the scene. Sure. So to set the stage of the crime scene, um, I would often use the words of Jeff Baker, who was the first emergency technician, the EMT, who arrived on the scene just a couple of minutes after the 911 call came. And he said um, it made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up on it. And Jeff Baker had been an EMT in D.C. for 10 or 15 or maybe more years, and he'd seen hundreds of terrible, violent murder homicide scenes. And what he discovered when he went inside, first, all three people who lived in the house that he encountered were behaving quite strangely. He saw Victor Zaborski first. Victor met him on the front step of the house. He's still on the 911 call. And he's wearing a white bathrobe, and his hair was slicked back. And Jeff felt like he looked like he'd been sort of freshly showered. And he was still on the call with the dispatcher, so he really just sort of gestured the, Jeff, the EMT, into the house and said, just go upstairs, or words to that effect. Jeff then went to the second floor, and he encountered Dylan Ward coming out of a bathroom on the second floor. And Dylan Ward also was wearing, I think at that point, he was wearing just a bath towel as if he had just stepped out of a shower, and Jeff says that Dylan Ward looked me right in the eye and walked past me and went into his bedroom and shut his door. So Jeff knows he's responding to a, to a, uh, a violent assault, a possible homicide in this house. And the first two people he meets are calm, cool, collected, and seemingly disengaged. So the third person he encounters is Joe Price. And that's when he gets to the end of the second floor hallway, steps into the room where Robert was sleeping, the guest room. And he sees two things right away. Joe Price is sitting on this fold-out bed, a, a couch pull-out bed, with his back to him, and he's only wearing kind of underwear you would sleep in. And then laying on the bed is Robert Vaughn, uh, motionless. And the first impressions Jeff had were Robert Vaughn is basically dressed. He's wearing like a 
t-shirt and jean shorts or something like that that you would wear to go to sleep in. Um, he could see immediately three relatively small puncture wounds uh, in his shirt, in his chest, with just really small blood spots around them. And otherwise, the room seemed completely undisturbed to the extent that the bed he was lying on hadn't been slept in. Somebody had pulled back the cover sheet and the blanket, as you do, just sort of tuck back the bed. Um, and Robert was laying on top of that with his head on the pillow. But nothing had been disturbed. There's no scene, s- sign of commotion. Robert's uh, wallet and watch were sitting on the nightstand alongside of a bloody knife. The first impression that you would have had coming into this crime scene is that this is nothing at all what I would expect when I had just been told by the 911 operator somebody broke into our house and stabbed our best friend to death. What you found were three men who were all eerily calm, cool, and collected in a crime scene in which nothing appeared to have been disturbed. And Robert Wan himself, um, for all intents and purposes, asleep, except for the fact that he had these three small stab wounds in his chest. Yeah, it was very, very odd. So immediately the crime scene, the state the body was found in, uh, the, the demeanor of, of the men, the, the residents there, that all drew immediate suspicion from the police, even the uh, the EMT, um, which is the other thing I wanted to say about the uh, the show that's so compelling is that you are seeing the people that actually were there. You know, you, you see, you know, the investigators, you see the EMT, he talks about it, firsthand accounts. So that's really, um, really powerful. But Another factor that contributed to this that we see in the show, and you mentioned earlier, is that the three men who lived in the home were gay um, and were in this polyamorous relationship. So the question I had for you is, do you think that the investigators focus on their sexual orientation? Do you think that hindered the case or was it an important factor based on the crime, you know, as it unfolded? So the fact that uh, the three men living in the house who quickly became the suspects in Robert Wallen's murder were gay definitely had an impact on the investigation and in a way that I don't necessarily want to give away because it affects the end of the story. And of course, I hope everybody will watch it. It does affect the uh, the subsequent trial that comes up in a, in a surprising way. But when you watch the show or if you do or any of your own research on, online or you know, look at any resources. When the detectives invited uh, the three, at that time, just people of interest, I guess you would call them, down to the police station for questioning in individual interrogation rooms, many of those detectives immediately latched on to the fact that they were gay. And they asked a lot of probing. And, you know, frankly, to our ears now, and probably even back in 2006, they were a fairly homophobic approach to the entire thing. One of them, um, one of the detectives, the initial investigating detectives just immediately went to the conclusion that Robert was there to have a sexual experience with one or more of these men, even though um, the three men assured them that Robert is straight. He's never indicated any interest in men of any kind, and he's happily married to a woman, and they've known him forever. They repeated that over and over again in the interrogations. But the detectives seemed to latch on to that, saying, give us a break. You're three gay guys. And as a guy comes over to your house to spend the night, it could only mean one thing, right? And that became a kind of a force that was shaping really even the initial questioning of the suspects. And it may or may not, to a certain degree, have shaped the way the, um, the investigation went. But that fact actually led to one of the immediate first really surprising revelations about, about their relationship that the investigators found just within a few days of looking at the house, maybe even in the same night. Would you like to receive texts from Once Upon a Crime? You can opt in by texting OUAC to 408-676-1770. That's the letters OUAC to 408 408- Six seven six one seven seven zero. You'll receive texts alerting you to new episodes, special giveaways, true crime trivia, and more. The information is in the show notes as well as on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Text messaging is provided by textsanity.com. Text message rates may apply. Like we said, we don't want to give away too many spoilers. We don't want to ruin it for you because I think you're definitely going to get hooked once you first start watching it. And so, you know, we don't want to ruin that for you. 
But there was a, a couple more questions that popped up for me as I watched this. And, and you, as you know, the person who put together this, you know, uh, with your co-producer, it's like, I imagine there's, there's some things that maybe came with questions for you or things that maybe you discovered while you were, um, you know, working on this project. And of course, beyond the obvious question, which is the title of the show of who killed Robert Wan, um, was there any other big questions that you were looking to answer, you know, after you started researching this case? Like, I always have these, like, kind of peripheral questions when I'm researching something like, what do we know about so-and-so, like maybe a player in the story, what their backstory that might you know, explain something, you know, in this of how things happened, any kind of uh, clues that maybe came up as far as the relationships between Robert and maybe his good friend Joe or, or any of the other men, um, or even anything that maybe about Robert himself that surprised you that maybe you thought, well, maybe that played into what happened or, you know, just just those kind of things that maybe won't necessarily make it in the story because they're just speculation, but, you know, maybe the questions that came up for you are things that you found interesting while working on it. Some of the things that came up as a, some of the things that were especially interesting to me as I was developing the show with uh, Glenn Kirshner. So to, to clarify, I developed the show. Basically I created the show concept with Glenn as my partner, as the prosecutor. And then we pitched it out to production companies and we uh, set up this project with Jupiter Entertainment. And so we eventually took it to Peacock Productions, who then set up the show. And at that point, my role was largely over. I had created the entire show concept and laid out how the story should or could be told, but I wasn't the director of the show or anything like that. So um, the things that really sprung out to me when we were creating this show are about how the investigation went off the rails in some surprising ways. And that's not to say that the investigators or the police or the prosecutor's office uh, did anything, you know, terribly or, or, or grotesquely wrong. There were a couple of mistakes made, and, and Glenn Kirshner would freely admit one or two of them. There was some trouble with, with forensic evidence gathering that became a problem. But there were some bigger questions that nobody seemed to be able to answer. One of them, um, and I'm not, I'm not even sure this is in the show, one of them had to do with Robert Wan's phone. He had a BlackBerry phone. And so investigators were eager to get their hands on it because they thought that will certainly give some information as to who he might have, might have spoken to right before he died, um, any emails he'd been getting, receiving, or texts. You can guess. It's loaded with information. They collected his phone, and because um, the Homicide Division of Washington, D.C., is really part of the federal government. When they have to do digital forensics of this kind, they often partner with the Secret Service. And so they gave the phone to the Secret Service to analyze and review, but then the phone basically disappeared. The investigating homicide detectives realized they, don't, they didn't know where the phone was. And the Secret Service said, well, we, we returned it to the homicide detective's office. The detective's office had no idea where the phone was, and they eventually found out that the phone had turned up back at Robert's work. He had gotten it from, as a work phone, from Radio Free Asia. And the next time they saw the phone again, it was at Radio Free Asia. And they said, well, it was returned to us and it had been wiped clean. Mm. And so there's some strange story about what happened to Robert Wan's phone before it was able to be actually uh, digitally examined for clues or evidence about who could have killed him. And so that itself could be the, the premise of an entire mystery about the show. And it's just one of many layers of the story that remain kind of unsolved. Nobody to this day is really sure what happened to Robert's phone. And so to answer your question, the things that really interested me, the big ideas were about how many different directions this investigation could go in that ultimately hit a brick wall and how a case that on its face seem to be so cut and dried could still be when you really look at the evidence and when you look at the ways that people can be brought to trial or charged with any of these crimes, the ways in which the evidence and the evidence gathering and the, the, the investigative techniques were ultimately inadequate in a way, uh, to me was a really surprising and amazing idea. Um, it really showed the limits of what the law can do and what uh, police investigations can do as opposed to what we see on you know tv shows like uh, you know law and order type shows there really is quite a big gap and so 
when you have a situation where there are three suspects, three men living in the house, who say that an intruder broke into the home uh, and killed their friend, and then you look at the facts that would have to be true for that to be true, um, and realize that it's very difficult to believe that, but then when you realize there also is no other compelling argument or case to be made that that isn't the case, you're really left with quite a conundrum. The biggest thing that struck me was how we can have a murder case with so much known about it and so much evidence gathered and so many testimonies taken and yet know ultimately so little about what actually happened in that house that night. That's the core, the core mystery to me that I found irresistible. Yeah, because it's one of those things like first glance is like the intruder theory, right? And there's there's these cases that we have several of these and these become, they kind of blow up like say John Benet Ramsey. It's like, okay, that couldn't have happened or it's it's very far-fetched that that happened. But yet, what's the motivation? You know, it's like, okay, why did this happen? How did this happen? There was such a short time frame too from when he arrived to when the 911 call was made. And it's not like he was there for hours and hours and something could have got out of control, you know. And how much time did they have to clean up if there was some kind of struggle? Because the house looked pristine, I mean, <laughs> from the, the pictures. And it's like, well, wait a minute, none of this jibes. None of it jibes. So it, it leaves, you know, anybody who watches this or learns about it to really just come up with, you know, so many possible theories that you can't really pin down. You know, so um, so did you come away with any kind of theories of maybe what you think happened? Well, sure. Um, you know, after working on the story, working on what the show would be like, looking at the evidence, um, I conducted interviews, um, you know, pre-show interviews with, you know, many, many people associated with the case, you know, with the, some of the detectives, with the EMT worker, with the medical examiner, with some of the lawyers, um, I interviewed, um, I spoke to Robert Wan's wife, who ultimately didn't appear in the show for reasons of her own, but I spoke to her for quite a while um, about the whole thing. It's very easy to, you know, come up with a theory that in your mind will add up almost completely, but then there'll always be some piece of the puzzle that doesn't quite fit. Again, the idea of making a puzzle and thinking it's going to add up to a picture of a bear, um, in this case... No matter how you arrange the pieces of the puzzle, no picture really emerges. So I do have a personal belief, based on what I know about the case, about what is likely to have happened. But um, I certainly wouldn't say that this, my personal belief would hold up in court because uh, the investigators and the prosecutors took every possible conceivable angle to try to charge these guys with the crime. And it... Ultimately, it was very difficult to find ways to commit them. And so to answer your question, I do think I have an idea what would happen, what happened that night, but I don't have any specific thing that I can say this proves what happened under that roof on that night. All I can do is kind of connect dots and come up with a likely scenario, but not something that to me is a rock solid bulletproof idea. That's the most interesting part about it is that there is, there is some no evidence, there's, there's all of these things. And yet, like you said, it doesn't play out the way it does on television. It doesn't play out the way that we would see it, you know, on, on some kind of a drama or something. There's so many factors and we could be looking at something and think, oh, this looks very clear, but still have really no idea because you don't know what was going on in somebody's head or what was, you know, maybe something that happened in a moment. You'll never be privy to that. So there's, there's no way to know. And it could look like something completely different than what you think, or it could be something completely different than maybe what you see. So I don't know, you know, the more I, I see things like this, and especially this program is so well laid out the way that everybody gives their perspective from first person accounts and all these other things. Um, the people that knew, you know, the victim and the people that were accused, you're left thinking, well, this is what we know. And this is what we maybe think happened. But what, what do you think happened? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of where this spins out to um, as far as viewers, people that consume these kinds of stories. Like they say, you know, truth is always stranger than fiction. So there we go. 
<laughs> Very That's much like so. And I'm not even giving away some of the biggest bombshells in the story because I don't want to do that. Definitely encourage everybody to go and watch this streaming now on Peacock. You kind of mentioned this a little bit, but just as a final word, what would you want viewers to consider as they watch Who Killed Robert Wan? Like what are the big takeaways that you hope they get out of it? What I hope viewers take away from watching the show, and I certainly encourage them to, because it is unlike any true crime show that I've seen in recent years, for sure, is keep an open mind. It's easy to hear the elevator pitch story, uh, version of the story, you know, there's three guys invite their friend over to spend the night in their house, and the friend winds up dead, and there's no sign of an intruder. You just can easily leap to a conclusion about what happened. But the closer you look at this story, at this case, the more blurry it becomes. So viewers should watch it with interest. They should watch it closely. They should think about what they're being shown. Um, they should think about what the evidence turns out to be. They should think about what they feel themselves about these characters and who they could be and who they couldn't be. And try not to leap to any conclusions and really take a good hard look at at the story and see what conclusion they draw about what really happened. The show title, Who Killed Robert Wan, it ends in a question mark. It's a mystery. It's There's a question mark at the end for a reason. And it's a challenge to the viewers to look deeply into this case as deeply as we did and see what they can discover on their own. Right. One more really interesting thing about the show, Who Killed Robert Wan, is that it ends with a tip line, an active tip line. And when you watch the show, it's two episodes, and when you get to the end of it, there's a phone number that anybody can dial that is monitored and is recorded. And um, it is to collect information or tips or ideas or information that anybody in the viewing audience might have about this really compelling murder case. And so um, it indicates to me and it should indicate to the viewers that there is more to the story to be known. There, and we don't know the end of the story yet. And there are people out there in the world who do know the things that we don't know right now. And that information could come forward. So uh, for anybody who's interested in the show, and I hope you are, and if you watch this and you do know something, call that number because the investigators uh, in Washington, D.C., will take information seriously if it comes to them. Yes, it's still an active case, correct? It's still an open case. An open case. Open. Right, exactly. I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking about this fascinating story. I'm sure I'll be talking about it with other people because it's just so interesting and there's so much to consider. But I want to thank you for joining me on the show. I really, really enjoyed our discussion. And I strongly encourage everyone to watch Who Killed Robert Wan, like I said, now streaming on Peacock. And interact with us on the Once Upon a Crimes Facebook group because I really want to hear your thoughts about what you think or what your theory is on this fascinating case. So please do that. Thank you, Paul, so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very you much. Too. And that will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Paul Epstein, documentary filmmaker and co-producer of Who Killed Robert Wan. You can watch this fascinating two-part documentary on Peacock TV. It's streaming now. There's a link to a preview in the show notes. Mother's Day is next Sunday in the U.S., and I wish everyone who is a mom, stepmom, dog, cat, or other pet mom or mother figure a wonderful holiday. I'll be back the following week on May 22nd with a special mom-themed true crime episode. Make sure to follow or subscribe to Once Upon a Crime so you don't miss an episode. Join our Patreon for bonus episodes every month, as well as access to every episode early and ad-free. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. Don't forget, CrimeCon UK in London is coming up super quick. We're only a little over a month away from the premier true crime weekend. I'll be there on Podcast Road to meet you. If you're attending CrimeCon in London on June 10th and 11th, make sure to mark your program to catch my live show with none other than Tyler from Minds of Madness. It's going to be awesome. Register at crimecon.co.uk and use my offer code 
once upon to claim your discount. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>